Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knapp. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. So what do we got today, John? What are we, what are we, what are we serving up today? Today we are serving up a classic road movie, Two Lane Blacktop. 1971, directed by Monty Hellman. Monty Hellman, very interesting character. He's directed a couple of movies we've done on our show. Right in the Whirlwind and uh, The Shooting. Two terrific movies. Two very interesting westerns that have become cult classics. Absolutely. Monty, Monty Hellman had a real quality to his directing, and um, I'm really sorry he didn't direct more movies because he really was a, a, a top-notch director, and I, I would say right up there with his other contemporaries like uh, Scorsese, Coppola, and Spielberg. So I don't know. I don't know why he didn't do more movies. I, I don't know why his career went uh, the way it did, but uh, we're lucky to have his oeuvre of the films he did do that are, that are terrific. Like a lot of our favorite directors of that time period, he started out in the Roger Corman school. Absolutely. He was definitely uh, a Roger Corman alum. He put up the money for uh, Monty Hellman to direct a version of Waiting for Godot in Los Angeles. Uh, it had never run in Los Angeles before, and uh, Corman put the, put the cash up for him to bankroll you, Monty Hellman. You mean the stage production? Yeah, and you know he also did a lot of editing. He considered himself a better editor than he was a director. He actually said that uh, he 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 edited the Wild Angels for Roger Corman. He was the editor for uh, Peck and Paws, The Killer Elite. Believe that or not, in 1975, after his career as a director was essentially over, basically. So the screenplay was written by uh, Rudy Wurlitzer. He's a legendary screenwriter and uh this is probably his most well-known script what's interesting is i i i've read the script recently and it reads really well it's a really fun script to read but when you notice the the film itself it it does not have all the lines that rudy Wurlitzer put into the script and i think the thing is that he had a vision in his mind when he was writing it but it was not going to translate coming out of actors mouths that way yeah a lot of the lines still exist but there's a lot more dialogue from the girl and a variety of dialogue that takes place between the driver and the girl and that's all gone and i, I think it's i think the movie's better for it because i think a lot of the lines that are in the script don't really translate to film and i think monty helen once again as an editor and a writer uh, i think he came in and he probably took out a lot of it sort of like clint eastwood did in the good the bad and the ugly yeah, uh, are you saying there was a lot of dialogue in the script on paper that didn't make it to the movie? Exactly. Okay. He wrote this experimental novel in the 60s called Nog, and that was like a cult novel of the time. So I think that's how he got in with this kind of new maverick filmmakers. He went on to write Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Right. Uh, you know, a big deal for, for Peck and Paul uh, yeah. fans. And then uh, Alex Cox, the director, English director brought him in to do Walker, I guess based on a real kind of revolutionary character in the in Central yeah. America. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, funny enough, Candy Mountain for the photographer Robert Frank. Robert Frank, yeah. They they, they share co-directing credits in it. I'm not sure oh, who did okay. what right. and whatnot. But, yeah, obviously Robert Frank, the great photographer, black and white mostly photographer, and also known for Cocksucker Blues. There you go. Yeah, and then this uh, Little Buddha for Bernardo Bertolucci. And for cinematographer, there's two listed. One guy, Jack Dearson, he's got a very small... Very small. Resume. <laughs> uh, so small that he some films like Virgin Cowboy, he changed his name to Jacques Dearson. You know, I can see why. Did you did you did you do the rundown of the plots? Yeah, plot well. summation of a Virgin Cowboy. I can see why he uh, had a little nom de plume on that one. It looked like a fun shoot, if you ask me. Well, I, I, I'm not saying I didn't want to see the movie. Yeah, I'm not sure what he shot on this film, but the other uh, cinematographer, Gregory Sandor, yeah. I, I I assumed did most of the shooting because he was the cinematographer 
for the shooting and ride the whirlwind. All really top-notch stuff, right, John? I mean, it, it, his his ability with the camera is just, just amazing. And it has that same quality, right? Those sure. films are kind of these weird existential westerns. It has that same feel to it. And then he actually went on to, to shoot Sisters for um, Brian De Palma. Brian De Palma, yeah. What's, what's interesting about this for me, John, is I'm looking at the credits here, and normally we can talk a while about the credits and uh, kind of rhapsodize about this person's work, that person's work. We, we have people involved in this that they don't really have a huge track record. We're talking James Taylor as the driver. Yep. Uh, we're talking Dennis Wilson as the mechanic, and neither of these guys have ever done a movie before right. this and really never did anything after that as far as making movies, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and James Taylor, this was like the very beginning of his career. Maybe yeah. he had one album out? Yes, his first album came out. I, I, I uh, was listening to uh, an interview with Monty Hellman, and he was saying that, you know, he's looking for actors to do this thing, and he was driving down, I guess, Santa Monica Boulevard, and there was a big billboard, and James Taylor's face was huge on it. His yeah. first album had just come out, and he goes, you know, I, I like the face on that guy. Now, talk about a leap of faith, because, you know, Monty Hellman liked his face, but... I mean, who's to say if this guy can act his way out of a paper bag, right? Well, the, the idea, and when we talk about the film, is like James Taylor as the driver and, right. and Dennis Wilson as the mechanic. Right. It's essentially non-actors. They're not really acting. <laughs> well, an, an interesting thing about it is, um, once again, I was listening to an interview with Monty Hellman, and he was saying that Dennis Wilson, uh, one of the Wilson brothers from the Beach Boys, the drummer, actually, from the yeah. Beach Boys, Monty Hellman said that he was the most um, unself-conscious actor he'd ever worked with. Hmm. And when you watch him, he is so in the moment yeah. of every little thing, and he reacts yeah. to lines coming out of other people's mouths like he would react if he just had been sitting there at a, a, a road stop diner and somebody had said something, he yeah. reacts in that way. So it's, it's when you watch it closely, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, it's also, you know, Monty Hellman is a, obviously a big fan of European cinema and that naturalistic way of acting. Like if you yeah. think of um, films like Eric Roma's films, yeah. very naturalistic acting. And these two guys kind of fit that bill. Absolutely fit the bill. And just a, yeah. a side note on Dennis Wilson. This is like the very early 70s. They probably shot it in 70. Yeah. Right after the Manson attacks and they right. were... In trial, Dennis Wilson is the guy that introduced Manson into the Hollywood scene. He actually wow. got Manson a recording contract. Strange bedfellows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, he uh, he picked up two of the Manson girls who were hitchhiking, and they ended up living in his house. And the Manson crew moved in for a couple of months, believe it or not. Dennis Wilson, a free spirit, if there ever was one. Tell you, and he's a free spirit in this movie. <laughs> and he certainly comes across that way, no doubt about it. And then we have Laurie Bird as the And once girl. again, Laurie Bird, we're talking about a track record. You know, this this girl only did three movies. She did Two Lane Blacktop, she did Cockfighter, another Monty Hellman production, and she plays Paul Simon's beautiful girlfriend in Annie Hall. Right, and it's what is it like one, a couple of scenes in Hollywood, It's right? one scene. But interestingly enough, it was an easy piece of casting because uh, Lori Bird was uh, Artie Garfunkel's long-term girlfriend. Ah. Uh, unfortunately. She committed suicide. When she was living with Artie Garfunkel. Yeah, she did it in his apartment. It was a, an overdose of Valium. That's really terrible because she really had a lot of promise. She's got a great little face and, um, and has a lot of spirit. Yeah, I wonder why she didn't wasn't cast in more films. She just seems like a natural, you know, actress, and I would have thought she'd have a, a, a big career, but once again, that just never happened. So it's a strange little film to have these people just kind of arrive on the scene, do the movie, and then just kind of fade away from movies from that point on. And then, of course, the only professional actor in the cast, Mr. Warren Oates. You know, Warren Oates, for me, can do no wrong. I, I don't care what he's doing. He is just the primo actor of primo actors. I was yeah. just talking about the other day with my with my wife, and I said, you know what? This guy was as good as a Brando, a De Niro, or a Dustin Hoffman. Yeah, I mean, he is the quintessential character actor. He didn't star in a lot of films, but he was in quite a few films, and he's always 
you're always drawn to his presence. Absolutely. Um, but he's in a lot of uh, Sam Peckinpah films. One of our, well, two of our favorites, I guess, off the top of my head would be uh, The Wild Bunch. And then you got the coup de gras of performances from War Notes. Bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, my God. Yeah, that's, yeah. Numerous films. Another film we've talked about, Race with the Devil. Oh, I love Race with the Devil. Which yeah. is a great film. And my yeah. favorite gangster film of all time, and it's, I think, one of the best films about the Depression, uh, John Milius's Dillinger. Yeah. He is so good in that film. He is Dillinger in that film. He actually sort of looks like him with the pencil mustache and stuff. One other cast member who makes a brief appearance, and he's listed as H.D. Stanton. Who would that be? God bless him, Harry Dean Stanton. <laughs> uh, he, he's only in one scene, but he's, uh, as as I said about War Notes, and they were buddies for a long time. Yeah. Drinking buddies, yeah, yeah. hanging out buddies, just buddies. The thing is, Harry Dean Stanton's also such a pleasure to watch. Yeah. Every time he's on the screen, I don't care how small the part is, you just, you're drawn to him and you, you just want to see what he's going to do next. He's a pleasure. I, I love the way the movie opens up, John. You know, it's it just, you get, you get right into the middle of the action. Pre-credits, boom, you're right in. You're at this, uh, this piece of road uh, somewhere in Los Angeles and, and there's a race gearing up. And, and, and I love how you're right in the middle of the action. And the composition of this shot for the first shot is the roadway, kind of low angle, kind of like bumper POV. And, and you just see the waist and the legs of these guys walking around setting up this thing. They got flashlights, a red flashlight and a green flashlight. And they're going to do it like you do at the raceway. I think one thing we have to mention about this film, it's very big in the uh, hot rod culture uh, for a lot yes. of reasons that we'll kind of touch on. And, and neither Bob nor I are experts in the hot rod culture. But I will say... You know, I remember in the 70s, my cousins had hot rods. Uh, it was a big thing. It was maybe a little before our time. But I do remember, John. I remember when we were kids, it was big at the time. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know, Raceway Park. Yeah. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. You know, we. I remember that from the commercials. And you had the guy, who was the artist? I can't think of his name. Rat Fink, Ed Roth. So so we, we may not have really known about uh, souped up carburetors or anything, but we, we it was part of our culture growing up in the 60s. Right. And 70s. So this opening scene is literally <clears throat> what used to happen is gangs of people used to go to some remote road, like an airport right. road, and set right. up a drag race. And, and what's interesting about the opening scene is it's Los Angeles, so it's very multicultural black yep. white hispanic and some of the guys are in these racing club jackets uh-huh uh so this must be like some kind of semi-organized event that they do which again all part of that car culture the thing is it's it it reminds me of you know the scene in in american graffiti the part of the the car culture you're talking about um, George Lucas was part of that car culture. He was a big racing person. Yeah. Almost died in a, in a, in a, in a drag race. And uh, if you want to think about it this way, the two other characters in the film are the cars. Yeah. You know, you have a, a 55 Chevy and, and a 71 GTO, Pontiac right. GTO. So the whole thing with this car culture, and I remember this, is you. it was like a family. You picked a car manufacturer. You were either Chevy and your family was Chevy, like Camaros or, you know, Chevelles. You were a Ford family or a, that's a great point, Pontiac John. family. No, that's a big thing back then. I know. That's what I'm saying. It's a great point. Absolutely. <laughs> so these two cars, they actually have characters in this film for different reasons we'll talk about. Well, the thing is, for me, as soon as the movie opens up, I mean, I love I love the, 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 the whole thing. And you're seeing the racing going on. It's, it's very uh, handheld type stuff very very documentary feel to it yeah it's all available light it, it, it's wonderful it puts you in the movie right away and what happens for me is as soon as the movie starts i'm thinking i got a 69 chevy with a 396 <laughs> fuel heads and a hearst on the floor and that's exactly what these guys do they shut them up and they shut them down yeah, exactly. that's their whole life that's their existence yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what i love about the opening credits is it, it, it's you know, and once again, it's, it's Monty Hellman can just set up a shot like like nobody else, and and the opening credits are a shot straight down on the the double yellow line 
on the highway. And as it's going past, it's to the left. The, the line is to the left of the frame. And what it reminds me of, having shot a lot of film in my day, motion picture film, um, is, is when you see film run through a projector. Yeah. And that's what it looks like. You're seeing this, this little line come through, like on the, uh, the, the, the leader that you get back from the lab. And I'm almost expecting for Kodak yeah. you know, <laughs> to come running past. So I thought that was really neat for me, seeing that, you know, as, as have, having been so entrenched in that sort of thing, shooting motion picture film for so many years, um, and seeing that come by. And then it's the road as well. Right. And that and that and that sound that 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 sibilant sound of the of the tires on the um, on the yeah. blacktop and and a little tinny sound of the radio playing low. Right. As the, right. as we're going down the road, it just it took me right and put me right into that situation. It's a wonderful graphic with the titles on the right, but also it, it kind of symbolizes the movie, this endless road. Yes. You know, Agreed. that's that's basically the movie. Yeah. They do this drag race at night, and of course the cops show up, so they all split. I yeah. find it funny that after the the driver wins his race, he comes back to pick up the mechanic <laughs> and then takes off. Well, they really are a team, John. You know, of course, a- <laughs> yeah. And that's the other thing we should mention. Yeah. There's no names. It's And we're going to talk about them this way. The driver, the mechanic, the girl, the girl. And, and GTO. And GTO, yeah. Right. No names. That was one of the interesting things, I think, that, that the buzz about the screenplay was that there were no names. It was yeah. just these uh, these characters were who they were. It, right. was, it wasn't like Harry the mechanic or Billy the driver. It was right. just the driver. And, and so the next scene really shows you the detail in the film for the car culture. It's daylight, it's morning, and they're pulling over because they have to change the tires. They have to take off the race tires and put on the street tires. So yeah, I, I love I love the shot. It's the second shot after the credits end. Right. And and you know, we see them coming into a town and then this there's this one shot as they pull up to this rest stop. It's got a, a couple of not really rest stop, it's more like a picnic area. They have yeah. a couple of benches yeah. and stuff. And and this is what's so beautiful about Monty Hellman and the way he sets up a shot. And once again, I spoke about this earlier, and I'm going to speak about it again because I, I'm so impressed with this, is the economy. He'll take one shot and he'll he'll just fill up the scene or this one, fill up the frame is what I'm trying to say, with all this different action. The, the French call it the mise en scène. And I, and I mentioned this early on when we were, watch, when we were talking about uh, Ride in the Whirlwind. He takes a shot. And he has all these different things happening at all the edges and in between and around the middle of the shot. So in this particular shot, you have the car pull up and to the left of the frame, you see the, the mechanic get out and he opens his trunk. And he, it, which is really weird because it, what is that material, John? What, what kind of material is that? It's so light. Is it? Is it so tin? this is, no, this is the thing about the film. Like this is a hand built Right. 56 Chevy. It's made to race. So the trunk, the hood, the scoop, everything is fiberglass. And, and as I mentioned earlier, they, you know, when they race, they put these big, obviously fat tires on the rear. Now they're sure. changing these. They're going back right. to the street. So yeah, no, it's very authentic to this, this car culture. So back to the frame. Cause I just, I just, it just blew my mind watching this frame. It's to the back left of the frame. You have Dennis Wilson as the mechanic, and then you have James Taylor get out of the car, and he goes to the front of the car, and he takes a drink of water from the fountain. The fountain is about two inches from going out of frame, but he squeezes all this stuff into the shot, and I just I was just so impressed with how much he gets out of just one frame. Yeah, it's almost like a almost like a play. It's like a stage. Sure, and he uses it all yeah. of it. It already sets up this movie because you know, as we talked, as you mentioned earlier, the economy's of scale here. It's visual, so you really have to pay attention. Absolutely. There's, the dialogue doesn't really progress the story. It's the image that does that. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, there really is no story to this, is there? No. <laughs> I mean, it's just you, you, you get into the situation— they're driving and we're following them along. Yeah. You know, we're just following them along. Almost like a film crew follow 
right. along these two drivers. But what's really cool about this thing here is this is about seven minutes or so into the film, and we've already established we've already established who these characters are. The driver drives, the mechanic works on the car, and you can see that the, the, how they are as a team because the mechanic's working on the car, changing the tires and stuff, and the driver gets out, takes a drink of water, sits down, and just starts talking to the guy. He has no intention of doing any work whatsoever on the car along with him because it's not his job. Right. We have these real defined jobs of who yeah. these guys are and what they do. They they don't talk much. They it's almost like they no they understand each other and as you That's said the they point. know their roles. No, I laugh <laughs> I laugh when you said they don't talk much because they really don't talk much. Right. Uh, and usually what they're talking about is cars. It's just cars. So then they they uh, pull into this gas station and they they go in the gas up the car. The guy pulls the trunk off, uh, and the young attendant. He's like, where do I put the gas? Basically. That's the other weird thing about it. I mean, is that a weight thing too, John? They they redid the gas tank to put it in the trunk? It's called like a, a gas or style interior. I'm not really sure why that is, but the... So the gas tank, uh, where you put the nozzle, is inside the trunk. Right. I imagine a, a lot of this car, like the windows, there's no roll-down windows. They're sliding windows. And so, they're plexi. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're plexi, right? Yeah. So, I think everything is to make the car lighter. lighter. It's, it's literally built to race, and that's it. It, it certainly is. And it, and it don't look very pretty. And right. I think that's really by design. It, it, it has this kind of uh, gray sandable primer. And it and I think it works on two levels. I, I don't know if there's a question of drag or something with paint. I don't know about that. But I think it works really well when they want to hustle people. When they're racing them, exactly. Here's, a, here's an old model car. It does. It does not look streamlined. <laughs> exactly. It is not. It, it doesn't have any real pizzazz to it. It just yeah. looks like a piece of crap. So this is a really good way to hustle people when you want to draw. When yeah. you want to race against their souped-up machine. So the attendant's curious about the car, and he's like, "Chevy Block? Yeah. Three ninety six. Four fifty four. How fast will she run? Depends on who's around. Exactly. What's cool about it, though, is 454 is literally the biggest engine block you can get in a, in a Chevy. It's impressive. And the other interesting thing about the scene really quick is the guy that walks over. With the Fl with the Fred Flintstone shirt, John? It's a Glendale <laughs> Speed Center shirt. That guy is Richard Ruth. He's the fabricator of the car. He built oh, that car that. for this. He built that car for the for the movie. So as you're, as you're talking about this, John, you, know, you have the kid. He's in the extreme left-hand corner of the frame. And then you got the mechanic. He's kind of in the middle of the frame. And then all the way to the right, you got the driver. And then you see two guys come out in the middle of the frame. And there's no cutting, John. I yeah. mean, here it just it's all takes place in this one frame. And I just can't say enough about Monty Hellman setting up a shot. And it's got... The thing is, this movie originally was supposed to be a million dollar budget that that's that's what they set out to get to right. do the movie you know the studio balked and said well we'll give you nine hundred thousand and they took it and monty helmet said they brought the picture in for about eight hundred thousand which is wow. amazing wow. but this is the economy in which monty hellman could work he could work with any goddamn budget you threw at him because yeah. he just knew how to put a picture together it's interesting that you talk about these frame compositions because you just made me think of this. Like George Lucas, Coppola, Hellman, all these guys were big fans of Kurosawa. And one thing about Kurosawa's film, High and Low, it's very similar in that he plays these scenes out. It's a widescreen movie. And again, that is all about compositions and where people are in relation to each other in the frame. Uh, so there's a lot of that in this film, as you pointed out. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Hitchcock and Spielberg, and they love to cut. And they were cut for this, to this, to this. Right. But there's something, I gotta say, such a pleasure to watch all these little things play out. And you can watch this movie a whole bunch of times and go, wait, I didn't see this happening in that lower left-hand corner yeah. of this frame. So it's it's really something you want to go back and watch several times. Uh, it's just a treat. And also the fact, as you said, it's low budget. They really don't have a lot of time to do different setups. Exactly, that's it. You, you don't have to do all these setups if you're smart enough right. and you plot this out just to get everything you can in that one frame, and it's beautiful. Yeah. So there, next thing we see them, they're driving down the road, and there's this car honking behind them. 
It's it's an actual 1970 Pontiac GTO. The color was a factory color called Orbit Orange. And what's weird about it is they pull up right on side and there's two guys in the car, right? One guy in the passenger seat is this older, bald guy. Yeah. And you're like, what the hell is going on? And there's no reaction coming from the driver or the mechanic. They just look <laughs> over. No reaction, nothing. <laughs> and, and you got you got Warren Oates just grinning, you know, like a Cheshire Cat <laughs> smile, his huge, big tooth smile that Warren Oates no had. No one can grin like no, Warren Oates. No way. Absolutely not. <laughs> and and he just honks and passes him by. And you're uh, like, who is this guy? What's that all about? But the interesting <laughs> thing is, this sets it up so well, you have GTO comes in and he's been set up now. Yeah. As the movie progresses, I, I I don't want to get too ahead, but as the movie progresses, there is nary a moment when you see GTO in the car that he has the same exact passenger. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which is funny because you see this old ball guy, you don't know anything about the movie yet, and you're going, no. what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and then, very shortly after that, we have the introduction of the girl. Yes. And I once again, I, I, I hate to go on and on and on about it. Oh, my God. Yeah, keep going on about this. <laughs> it's beautifully set up. They're in this luncheonette, the driver and the mechanic, and they're sitting there uh, by the window, and they're just eating. Of course, they're just eating, and they're not talking. Yes, right, <laughs> just, right. I, I just, it's, it just makes me uncomfortable to watch you just sitting there and eating, eating. <laughs> so outside the window. That's not like us in a diner. No, it's People not. Like, That's why shut up. <laughs> It's exactly right. So I'm like, what the hell? You have nothing to talk about? <laughs> so outside the window, you see this old beat up kind of hippie van thing. Hippie van, hand painted, psychedelic picture. And you see this girl. She's a hippie chick. She's got that, um, you know, military shirt on, right? The army shirt right, that was right. a big deal in the 70s. And so she gets out, this hippie chick. She gets out. And when she gets out, she has to untie a piece of rope that is holding the door <laughs> on. So it gives you an idea what the vehicle's like. So she gets out. She fumbles around a little bit. She grabs her bag of stuff, her belongings, obviously. And then she starts to move out of frame, and the camera pans along with her. And it pans over to the door. And you can see through the glass of the door, you see the mechanic in the driver's car. She opens the door of this car, throws her stuff in, and just sits in the back. Yeah. And you go, what? <laughs> Definition of hippie chick, man. That's like, you know, back in the day. Free spirit, right? Free spirit, man, exactly. And I love how, how you know, the two guys get out, the driver and the mechanic get out. They get in the car, they see the girl in the back seat, and <clears throat> they say nothing. They just drive away. Exactly. Mechanic gets in first, and he yeah. looks back. And no reaction. Just None. sits down like, oh, every day we get a yeah, new sure, uh, hitchhiker. <laughs> sure. I just want to add, there's not a huge soundtrack, but throughout, songs do pop up. In the Diner on the Jukebox is a cover version of Hit the Road Jack by Jerry Lee Lewis. Now that you brought it up, I, 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 it's the perfect time to say this, is Monty Hellman, for me, is, as an, as an editor has such a great taste and an understanding of where and how to work with music. And he does a beautiful job in this film of putting the music in at the right place, the right time, and, and to really make the scene pop. And he reminds me of Hal Ashby. Oh, yeah. Who, another master of using the right song, popular songs and whatnot, in a movie. Hal Ashby being, once again, starting as an editor. Yes. And, and Martin Scorsese who also yes. was an editor early on in his career. Worked so on Woodstock. It's a lot of stuff. Um, and also Elvis on tour. He, um, <laughs> <laughs> he, he knew how to work with music from the editor uh, point of view. And, and it's, right. it's perfect. So um, one little cultural reference. I like these in movies. Uh, they're driving on and the girl uh, starts asking them, you guys aren't the Zodiac killers or anything like that, are you? Well, uh, it's a little late for that, don't you think, John? Exactly. You're already <laughs> prisoner in their car. 
But I thought that was interesting because this is 70, 71. Right. Those killings had just, they've never found the killer. Those were actually happening around that time. That was, it's a great line. I love the way she delivered it. Yeah. And, and as I said, you know, it's a little late for that now, sweetheart. <laughs> if they are. Right, right. That's the other thing. You mentioned she's wearing a, um, a an army surplus yeah. Shirt or jacket. And she's exactly. got an army duffel bag. Again, this is early 70s. Vietnam's going on. They never right. mention it. There's no political viewpoint in this film, really. Well, these guys, I mean, these guys certainly are not interested in politics. It's just, you know, it's 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 the carburetor. It's the points. Yeah. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> Whatever's about getting the car from point A to point B and winning some money during the course of time. Yeah. So there's, there's a, just I'm just going to jump in here with one little thing because it, it just reminded me of because we're talking about okay they're they're on the road they're just driving down the road that's what they're all about <clears throat> and there's a line in it the driver says you can never go too fast and I I think they made a big mistake of not putting that on the poster that should have been their tagline <laughs> you know you can never go too fast I think that would have really <laughs> sold some extra tickets there for sure but well that's all they're that's all they're thinking about because. Yeah. When they have this girl in the car and they've just met her, she starts massaging the mechanic's shoulders. He doesn't even say anything to her. He looks to the driver and he's like, she don't seem to be breathing right. Might be the jets. All they think about is <laughs> the car, the fine tuning of this car. And the interesting thing is the girl doesn't seem to know what she wants because she's massaging the mechanic's shoulders while she's looking at the driver. Right. Right. There's this unsaid kind of attraction between her and the driver, but they're both kind of too awkward to, to do anything about it. But she goes back and forth. She's a very fickle character. I mean, she's yeah. a real a classic fickle female in this respect because she doesn't really know what the hell she wants to do. Right. Well, she's that's her character. She's yeah. I mean, she's these guys have a purpose. They're on the road to race. Her, she's, she's, she's just going from one place to the other. She's like a pinball, in a sense. What's interesting is she was not, Lori Bird was not supposed to be in the movie originally. They met her at, as part of the casting. Monty Hellman liked her, something quality about her, but they weren't going to really use her. And they did these interviews with her. Just basically her talking and, and, and being and, and, and getting, getting a vibe of who this character was. And as they were going through the casting, somebody finally said, well, what about that girl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she became the character. <laughs> she hitchhiked onto the movie. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> so um, this movie is all about locations, too. So another character yes. in the film, they're actually driving on the original Route 66. Route 66, yep. So they stop in Santa Fe. There's a, a very interesting cinema verite scene where the girl is panhandling these tourists in the town square I don't think they're aware of the camera, right? They're, those... they're not. They're not. I, and, and, I, and I read this. Uh, Monty Helmut said they were shooting it pretty far away from this department store on the second floor through the window with a long lens. Right. They were going to get releases for the people to be in the movie. Yeah. But at this moment in time, right. nobody knew who Lori Bird was. And they just react accordingly yeah. as she's just some girl walking up to him. And it's so naturalistic. It's really wonderful to watch. And it's an interesting, you see these people, uh, like when you're watching a movie from that time period, it's all produced, everyone's in costume, whatever. Sure. This is like a time capsule, because these Absolutely. are real people from 71 on the street. It's so interesting to watch. And you got hippies, you got straight people, you got older people, yeah. you got a combination of both and yeah, whatnot. Yeah. I love when she runs across the street. And there's a guy there. He looks all kind of fringed out in some kind of fringe jacket or something, I think. Yeah. And, and and she runs past him. and He reaches out like he's going to take her in like a big bear hug. I think that was just some guy there. I don't think there was a production person at all. I think you're right. There was some guy there and he was high out of his head. <laughs> and was just going to hug this girl. And, and luckily she ran right past him, got out of his grasp. It's a really neat little scene. And, and, and these little textural things that Monty Hellman puts throughout the film, you don't see small towns like this anymore. No, you don't see no. this kind of thing. Everything's corporatized. You know, you're going to have an Applebee's there. You're not going to have a little right. diner place. Right. You're going to have Perkins or you're going to have Denny's or you're going to have, you know, whatever the big box stores are. And I love seeing this time period because it's, if you've ever just driven through parts of the country and just seen these small towns, they're really great to see. Yeah. Uh, the one little bit of dialogue in the scene uh, that's interesting is 
they're talking about how much money they have. And I think it's the mechanic says, we we got 300 racing bread and 20 to spend. So they have this budget where most of the money is going to be to bet on races, which is, I thought that was pretty interesting. We got $20 to spend. I get the sense they don't have a 401k, John, you know. (laughs) (laughs) No health insurance. It's kind of like a film budget. We got this much for the camera and and $2 for mac and cheese. (laughs) Right. And that's it. That's all you got. Then we cut to a nighttime scene. They're driving, and the doors are playing "Moonlight Drive." That song makes makes the the scene just kick. Yeah, it's just the perfect song, and it works so well. And it's shot pretty much just from one angle. It's it's through the driver's side window, and you see the driver in the foreground, a little soft, and you <clears> see <throat> the the mechanic in this passenger side, and he's doing a rundown of uh, of what he sees. Let me just jump in. They're at a classic drive-in, like Mel's yeah. drive-in, and there's yep. all these hot rods parked around the perimeter, so go. And and so the, so the mechanic just, he's sizing up it all. And he goes, okay, uh, 70s Camaro, 68 Barracuda, nothing there. Uh, there's a, a Roadrunner with a, a heavy in it, 70 Cuda. They got some uh, muscle here tonight. And what, what was fascinating to me, not being a car person, is this guy knew it all. Yeah. He knew, he knew the engines that yeah. they had. Yeah, yeah, He knew if they had something added on that was going to make it better. I mean, he just eyeballed it. And it just it blew my mind thinking, my God, the amount of knowledge that this guy has about cars and how they perform is unbelievable. He's like an well, encyclopedia. Again, time period, hot rod, hot rod culture. You had so many muscle car magazines out. People, my brother used to make tester models of the sure. hot rods. It, it was so big. And, and and that was such a big pastime. And and the driver, after this litany of cars by the mechanic, yeah. he's like, listen, all we got to do is rope in one. Yeah, exactly. What's also great about this film there's a shot, they're inside the car. The exposure inside the car is perfectly balanced with the outside. The source, as you said, the street lights are all source. The exposure in this film from inside the car is some of the best looking interior car stuff you'll ever see. It's a very good point because, you know, from a photographic point of view, that is really hard to achieve. Yeah. Because you have a very dark space and you have all this light outside it could very easily just be blown out and the interior would be so dark. But yeah, my hat's off to the cinematographer for that because yeah. that shot alone is worth the price of admission, as well are many of the uh, the available light shots that you see. So uh, they're in this driver and they finally settle on this custom green little hot rod that actually looks like a rat fink design. I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say it looks like a rat fink design for sure. And they're talking to the owner, who is, by the way... Rudy Wurlitzer. Rudy Wurlitzer. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect casting. Because yeah. he's kind of like the, he's like the intellectual hot rod guy. He's like the know-it-all kind of look to him. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a nice little cameo. He does a great job with it, too. Yeah. I love, I love how James Taylor, as the driver, does this sort of ah shucks hustle on him he says gee mister i bet it's pretty quick <laughs> <laughs> there's your setup right there he's, he's doing Where's... a mr haney on him <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's doing a mr haney on the outside but he's doing the jackie gleason and the hustler on the inside <laughs> so he so he hooks him in <laughs> and i love how he, he seals the deal <laughs> The, the, the hot rod guy, Rudy Wurlitzer, goes, he goes, you, you want to find out? Let's make it 50. And one of the best lines in the movie, let's make it three yards, motherfucker, and we'll have an automobile race. <laughs> it's a classic line. <laughs> James Taylor really takes his southern roots and, and shoves it into that line. So, of course, same, almost like a, a similar scene from the beginning. They go out to the quote unquote airport road. Right. Because it's interesting. Where else are you going to get a straightaway for a mile and a half? It's you know what I mean? Point. There's airport roads all over this country. You know what right. I mean? Like, I, yep. you know, it's this is where they kind of did these races. It's usually dark in the middle of nowhere. And you see this line of cars just come and they kind of line the street. 
Uh, it's almost like the scene in uh, Rebel Without a Cause when they're yes, lining yes. The, the race there with the, the headlights and stuff. But what's interesting is this looks so authentic, John. It, it just looks like you were you were like a fly on the wall or a spectator sitting there or standing there at that moment in time. And, and, and it's all available light. It's funny you mentioned American graffiti because yeah. these scenes look so much like American graffiti. You know, George... Lucas saw this film and and was like, I got to do a movie about growing up in this culture because that's what he did. It's a very good point, John. I agree. I agree. This must have been influential uh, on these other guys, too. So, of course, the Chevy wins, uh, which is interesting. The race themselves, the drag race, are not really centerpieced. They're just kind of shots. Okay, we won this. Next, let's go on. They don't really make a big deal about the actual race. It's not all this posturing and there's not this this snarky dialogue between the two of them, gritting of teeth and whatnot. It's just, here's the race. We shut them up and we shut them down. That's exactly (laughs) what they do. And and I love I love the exchange of the money. They had the one guy takes the money. His, his job is to hold the money. You get the money from the one hot rod guy. You get the, the money from the Chevy guys. Yes. And yes. he holds the money. And I love how the, the, the driver, you know, shut shuts him down and he just blows right past him. And then the guy who's holding the money just kind of bows down and hands, <laughs> hands the, the mechanic the money. And then they, that's it. So they pull up to this motel. It's an interesting thing that happens outside the driver, he's basically going for a walk. It's one of the few times he gives up the driver's seat and he just says, I'm going to go for a walk. I mean, the film does have a Western quality to it. He's almost like that kind of lone gunfighter figure. Like he just, sure. he just takes off and he goes to a bar. He needs some space, I guess. I guess, you know? yeah, it's interesting. And it makes sense. Yeah. But they don't make a big deal of it, but it, it no, just happens. No, not at all. Yeah. What's interesting about the scene when he goes into the bar, he goes into a couple of bars, but he goes into yeah. the second bar. It's more like a, a like a, a kind of like a lounge. The first one's like a dive bar. The second one's more like a fancier lounge. Yeah, like a lounge. Yeah, exactly. And in in the corner, there's there's a couple having a fight. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, who is it? Who's getting ripped a new asshole? It's <laughs> it's the it's the guy he just beat the, in the fucking race. It's Rudy Wurlitzer. Rudy, Rudy Wurlitzer's <laughs> having a really bad day, man. He just got his ass kicked in the race. He lost three hundred dollars, and now he's having his girlfriend just ream him out. Who happens to be um, Monty Helma's wife? What's funny about it? She takes off, and then he he's sitting there, and the drive the driver's at the bar, and he gives him a look. <laughs> And it's just like, it's not your night, man. It's like, it, this <laughs> exactly. guy lost twice tonight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So we come back to the to the motel room and, and you know, uh, the girl just climbs into bed with the mechanic. There's only one bed in the room. And I don't know where they were all going to sleep in the first place. Only one bed in the room. And so the mechanic's just lying on the bed with his filthy clothes on. And she just kind of picks up the sheet and... She starts turning the bed down, as you, right. as you say. That's the yeah. phrase, you know, she's, which is weird. She's just like pulling the covers off and he's just laying there. And he goes, okay, and he moves over. He kind of helps her do whatever he's going to do. And then we, we, cut, we cut away from that. There's no dialogue. There's no seduction to the scene. Exactly. Just, just, okay, uh, we're here. I, just, I guess I'll just climb in the bed. Well, it's it's very matter of fact. It's I'm here, you're here. Uh, if you can't be with the one you love, honey, <laughs> love the one you're with. Very, very, very do, 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 yeah, do, exactly. Do, do. There you go, Stephen Stills. <laughs> Poor James Stiller. You got the driver comes back. He just wants to go to bed. Yeah. And he's about to open the door, and he hears some noises. Yeah. Amorous action going on in there. And he just kind of slumps down and sits there outside the door. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, he's not going to get too much sleep tonight. He's going to be out in the cold. Yeah. He sits on his haunches. And well, that's the interesting thing, too. Again, none of this is is spelled out. Like the driver is like the quiet, silent type. You know, there's this attraction with the girl, but they, but he can't vocalize it. No. The other guy, Dennis Wilson, probably like in real life, he's just like the natural California dude where everything yep. is easy. It just comes sure. to him. You know what I mean? He didn't have to say a word. Nope. And it just happens for him. And it's exactly. an interesting dynamic between the That's two guys. That's a very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we finally meet GTO, who's the driver of this Pontiac. And he's he picks up this cowboy kind of guy wearing a suit, like the typical Western dress suit. 
What's interesting about the scene is this guy, GTO, the driver, starts spouting all these details about the car. And you know he's just dying to talk to someone. Well, that's it. You, you, it's, it's, it's so obvious. And the, and the guy is just not interested in talking to him at all. In fact, he starts to feign sleep early on. Well, he doesn't even get half the things this guy's going on about. I just love how he just launches into this whole monologue about all the features the car has. Uh, you know, this, this thing's got uh, 390 horsepower, 500 foot-pounds of torque, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> whatever that is. The thing is, I'm not saying whatever that is. He actually says whatever that is. <laughs> we so, all said whatever that is. That, that, that's what struck me funny about it. He goes, you know, if you want to you see more, uh, there's, the, uh, there's the whole owner's manual in the glove box. And I'm like, you know, that, you must have just read through it really well so you could just spout out these little factoids just yeah. so you seem impressive because you don't seem to know jack shit about this car or, well, cars, or cars, period. And, and, and every time we get another hitchhiker, he, he spouts some little thing about his past. I, I bought her in Bakersfield, California. I was testing jets at the time. You don't know if it's true. It sounds like bullshit, right? He, he is really amazing at just pulling stuff out of his ass at the drop of a hat. Yeah. He really is. And, uh, and he's just, just desperate for, for conversation and desperate to impress. And what's interesting is how quickly... Uh, he wears out his own welcome in his own car to yeah. the passengers. Well, it's, I mean, this is the dynamic of the movie. Like, he's this lone driver, right? He's desperate for company. These two guys, they pick up some girl. Yeah. They barely talk to each other about things. Yeah. But they're together. And this guy's alone. He's dying to talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about Warren Oates, if you had somebody else doing this dialogue you would just hate this guy so much right because he would right. be so obnoxious but warren oates has such a quality to his ability as an actor he inhabits the character he is this character and no matter how obnoxious he is or, or just goofy or stupid he just makes you feel so sorry for him yeah he's he's heartbreakingly yeah. an open wound yeah, you know, yeah, desperate for, for for company to, to to tap into something to hold on to something, but he can't help himself. Yeah, he just he's just a diary of the mouth. But he's like a puppy dog. You really feel for him. He tries to posture big, but he he don't have it. <laughs> well, it's definitely posturing, you, and you you yeah. kind of pick that up because uh, again, he's always coming up with some fact or something about his past. Uh, yeah, you know, the next scene he talks about, I got shot down twice over Korea, huh? <laughs> like, and then I decided it was time for some fun and games. I ran out of cash, started <laughs> testing jets. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, but then you know the the, the jets they kind of kind of wear out the, the 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 high. You know, you gotta get a new high. You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a line with with uh, uh, the girl in the back seat, I and mean, she's just getting tired of sitting back there. There's no uh, actually no seat back there. They they don't have room for a seat. They can't they can't use the weight. Right. So she's you know she's lying back there. She's made a little nook for herself. You know she's she's got some kind of a magazine image stuck up in there like it's her own little room and she made a little <laughs> a little bed for herself. Uh, I think it was where the world said something along the lines. It's it's almost like like a nest back there for her. Mm. And um, you know she's pissed off about the goddamn tools sticking in her back and whatnot. And, and these guys are not listening to a goddamn thing she's saying. Yeah. They're just talking about carburetors and spark plugs and and and, and checking out the rear end yeah. of the car. <laughs> and she says, she goes, she goes, I don't see anybody paying any attention to my rear end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the next scene, again, there's these little uh, locations. This is the Ute gas station, which Ute is like a, an uh, Indian reservation. reservation. And so the, so the GTO pulls in uh, and this cowboy jumps out of the car and he goes looking for the bathroom. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, he's too lazy to go all the way around, all the way around the building. Yeah, I, ca I can't figure it out because the way the shot is set up, you don't really know why he doesn't go to the men's room. I don't know, maybe it's somebody there locked in. A, he looks around he, the back. Yeah. You don't see what he's looking at. And he just exactly. decides to go into it's the ladies room. The right, ladies sure. room. Why not? There's no one else I, around. I have, been, I have been tempted to use the lady room over, over I my I have lifetime. used the ladies room. <laughs> well, there you go. 
you know, sometimes you just got to go. So. <laughs> and so he uses the ladies room. Mr. Uh, GTO is out front. He grabs a Coke. I love that scene, John. I love that scene. And and, and Warren Oates is so great because he, he does awkward so well. Yeah. It's all body language. So he's leaning up against the Coke machine and he just looks so fucking awkward. He's drinking a Coke. He doesn't even seem like he's enjoying it. He's doing it because he's supposed to like this or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and then he he doesn't know what to do with the bottle, so he, he puts it in the empty rack like it's his own little little place to, to hold the Coke. Uh, so the, the, the Chevy pulls in. There's a thing er, throughout the movie, and, and, and GTO mentions it earlier when he's talking to the cowboy. He's like, they're just a bunch of small-town car freaks. That, that's homemade stuff. So <laughs> he's kind of paranoid, too, right? He's got this little bit of paranoia about him, and he... There's something about these guys with this hand-built car. I'd say he's got a lot of paranoia about it. <laughs> but there's something about this hand-built car that's threatening to him because yes. he, that's the other dynamic. This yeah. is a hand-built hot rod. He's yeah. driving, it's one of the top GTO models, but it's off the assembly line. It's, it's, yeah, it's off, the, it's out of the lot, John. It's, you know, it's not a, it's not a souped up machine. It's, it's for everyday use, even if you're, you know, uh, an average husband, you know, who just wants to have a souped up car, then right. it's off the assembly line. It's a corporate car. So that's the dynamic also. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so these guys pull in. Um, what happens with the girl? She goes <laughs> to the bathroom. Well, she tries to use the bathroom and there's the guy just sitting taking a dump. Now, if I was going to use the ladies room, it would just be for number one. <laughs> exactly. I would never do it for number two. A and John, John, he's he's totally at home, dude. Because you know he didn't lay any, he didn't lay any paper down for that day. There you go. Seat. <laughs> well, if you're gonna take a dump, it's probably cleaner in the ladies' room. I would say yeah, that. Well, that, there's no <laughs> doubt in my mind about that. <laughs> this scene sets up the rest of the movie. And yes. I'll just point out some little things I noticed. The GTO guy is letting the gas station attendant check his oil. And when the Chevy pulls in, he goes up to them and he goes, check your oil. And the driver says, no, he'll get that. Okay. Yep. No one touches their car. They have their thing. You, yeah. you know, you can, you can gas it up, but, you know, I do the work. This is, yeah. this is my thing, my thing here. And that's it. And GTO is like, you know, he's your average Joe. Yeah. The scene that plays out when he's standing there with the Coke machine, he takes the bottle out. He drinks for a little while. Then he doesn't know what to do with it. He puts it back in the rack. As the car pulls up, he gets more and more nervous. Right. Because he doesn't know what to do with himself. So you're seeing it play out with this business of the Coke bottle, comes out of the rack, goes into the rack. He takes a couple of sips, and then he puts it back. And, and he's, he's, just, he's just a big ball of nervous energy because he doesn't know what to do. He wants to confront these guys, but he, he doesn't really have the nerve. He's about to do something. He takes a sip of Coke and then puts <clears throat> the bottle back. Yes. So this goes on for a couple of minutes before he even says anything to the mechanic until the mechanic, or rather, till the, till the driver turns around, <laughs> puts his arms up on the on, onto the gas tank, it just starts looking at him. Yeah. I, I, think him down. I think taunting him. Yeah. So in that shot, as you said, it's going on. The cowboy, he walks into the shot. <laughs> He grabs his case out of the car and he takes off. He's gonna <laughs> but, go hitchhike. But it's beautifully set up in the shot because you have <laughs> you have action going on on the left hand side. On the left hand side is the mechanic, and in the middle of the frame, with his arms up on the pump, he's taunting GTO and GTO's right. talking here. The girl makes her way around to the to the left of the driver, and then in the middle a space that's left. This is this is Monty Allen once again. The middle tiny space that's left. He has this action take place where this guy <laughs> takes a suitcase and runs through the center of the frame to the other side of the road to get thumb a ride from anybody else but right. this guy. <laughs> Desperate to get away from GTO. It's great. Um, so basically, the the setup is this: the the guy he kind of taunts the driver, taunts kind of GTO. Yeah. He he kind of insinuates, you know, this vehicle. It, it's less of a hot rod because it's an assembly line thing. By the way, the gas sixteen cents a gallon. Um, GTO he's Those paying for his gas. Those were the days. <laughs> um, he's paying. He finally pays for his gas. Yeah. Uh, with a credit card, that's note that, 
and he, he's upset. He gets in his car, but he can't seem to drive off. Uh, and then he gets out of the car. And then he gets back into the car. But what's great is, John, there's a, there's a little thing on the soundtrack that's so wonderful to this. It's the annoying, tinny, buzzing sound of you left your keys in the ignition. <laughs> right, right, right. So every time he gets in and out of the car, you have this... It's it's almost like like a like a raspberry or a noise for the amateurs because he's got this little tinny thing every time he gets in the car. Eh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he gets out of the car. Eh. So it's just it's this car just shows you what a, a, an amateur hour this guy is really all about. <laughs> the driver and the girl walk off alone. They go sit on this fence and and mm -hmm. this clearly this awkward space between them and and he tries to impress her i guess he starts talking about cicadas. <laughs> the cicadas yeah he starts talking about cicadas but he's talking about you know how long the, the, they live and their sex life and then they die really soon and they're like yeah yeah they life cycle and they come back only to have sex and mate and yeah, etc yeah this is this is pickup language john <laughs> But she's not impressed. Well, what I love about the scene also is, you know, she she says you're making me sick. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 what's great is he James Taylor flubs his lines a few times during the course of the movie. He does. But it, but in this scene in particular he flubs two or three lines. And Monty Hellman left it in. I think it's brilliant because that's exactly what would be happening. He wouldn't be able to get these lines out of his mouth because he's just so nervous and intimidated and well, awkward. Well, interesting you said that. I did read, even though this film is low budget, you know, Monty Hellman was a perfectionist. Many scenes he shot in 10 takes. I mean, he yeah, did multiple takes. James Taylor said he would have no problem <laughs> yeah. doing 16 so takes. So it's interesting you know, perhaps in the early takes, he couldn't get his lines down. He's flubbing them. And Monty Hellman, the the editor and director, yep. is yep. thinking, well, that could add to the scene because this guy's Absolutely. uncomfortable. So let's sure. use it. It's brilliant. Yes. It's it's definitely not scripted. It, it, it It's too natural right. that it happens that he, <clears throat> he just does it that way. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, really, really a, a fun scene. But a sad thing scene because she just says, you bore me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he sees he's not getting across, so he's like, well, well don't get any splinters, and he kind of marches off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'll just mention this quickly. She comes back to the station. She gets into GTO's car, who earlier we've seen him try to impress the cowboy with his collection of cassettes. She mentions, oh, these are really groovy records. Uh, and then he's, he goes on again, fibbing about his past, I think. <laughs> oh, I won the car in, in Vegas shooting craps. Uh, and then... Here we go. Another soundtrack piece. What's the song that comes on that she puts on? Uh, me and Bobby McGee, Chris Christopherson, right? Yeah. yeah. Me and Bobby McGee, Chris Christopherson. Well, there um, you go. They're, they're, they're traveling along and, you know, singing soft while Bobby played the blues. I did see an interview with Chris Christopherson and hmm. Monty Hellman. Oh, okay. And he saw Chris Christopherson at a club. Uh -huh. And he's like, I'm doing this movie. Can I use this song? And and he was like, sure. These are the contracts I love, John. You know, <laughs> none of this corporate bullshit. None of this, you know, I got, you see your lawyer, I'll see my. He just says, you know, I'd like to use a song. Oh, great. Yeah, go ahead, use it. Done. Yeah, I'm sure there was yeah. a contract, but there wasn't like all these lawyers in the way. No, and... but the interesting thing is you bring up the music part of it, though. But this movie had was took a real long time. There's a lot of different problems getting this movie out on yeah. on video originally, and then and then into DVD because Jim Morrison's estate ah. would not let them use the music. Wow! They said it has nothing to do with the contract you signed. Oh, for further uh, royalties for new media. Who knew? Right. 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 So that's what that's what took place there. So yeah, I I, I like the Chris Chris Officer approach myself. Yeah. <laughs> so they finally set this thing up where the driver challenges GTO. They're going back and forth, and, and, and basically, like, okay, let's race. Let's race for the pinks. Right. Pink slips, meaning the, the, the car's uh, the ownership. Exactly. Yeah. So the way the mechanic explains it, and this is the first I heard of this, you, you <laughs> both take your pink slips, you put it into an envelope, and you you mail it. And and actually, GTO is the guy that picks where they're racing to, and he picks Washington, D.C. 
Yeah, but the thing is, he just pulls it out of his ass. Yeah. He, just, he's, he just goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah smart ass. I, I'll tell you what, uh, Washington, D.C. And then he backtracks. He goes, they go, okay, you're on. He goes, uh, uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're on. We're, yeah. we're definitely on. I didn't think they were going to say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't, did he? They send it to general delivery, which is the yeah. thing. And whoever gets there first gets the pink slip for the other's car. Right. Interesting race, huh? Winner take all. Right. But what I what I love about the scene too, and it's you know, it's just it's little accidents, little things happen. Yeah. But the wind was really gusting up during this scene. And you know, he has his racing glove on top of when they're trying to hash this out. Yeah. He has yeah. his racing glove on yeah, top yeah. of the car and it's starting to blow away and he, he grabs <laughs> and he smacks it down so it doesn't go anywhere. Moros <laughs> does a beautiful job with this. And then, you yeah. know, the, the mechanic is showing him the the, the the route Basically, they're the going to take. The route they're yeah. going to take, right? And the map is blowing up in his face. I mean, it couldn't be <laughs> it, it it couldn't be more like slapstick, you know, Hal Roach, if you if you uh, if you wanted it to be. It, <laughs> he can't even hold the map down. He looks so <laughs> pathetic. It just was a great little scene. I love the next scene uh, on the soundtrack. Uh, actually, GTO is listening to the radio or or his tapes, and he's he's singing Maybelline. Yes. Now, I don't know who, who's doing Maybelline. It's certainly not Chuck. But, no. Uh, it's interesting. They do alternate versions. I don't know if it's because they couldn't afford the original or, or what. Be. But he's driving. There's another hitchhiker. Uh, another, this one's a real-looking cowboy. And uh, this guy's going to Oklahoma City. Right. And who's the, who's the hitchhiker? Harry Dean Stanton, or also known as H.D. Stanton. H.D. <laughs> Stanton. And so he gets in, and, and of course... GTO boasting once again. <laughs> he, he's in a test car. I'm running a test right now. <laughs> if I if I win, it could mean millions for the organization. For the organization, whatever that is. <laughs> I love how his story changes every time someone gets every in the car. time he builds on every it. time. <laughs> it's you like gotta this, give him credit. This is a man without a life, but he's creating this life. Oh boy! In his Can head, he create a life like nobody else. It's an awkward scene. It's an interesting thing. It's kind of heartbreaking, actually. It's an interesting scene where uh, Harry Dean Stanton gets in and he's he's relieved to get in and he says, "You don't mind if I stretch out and just get a little comfortable?" And uh, GTO's like, "Yeah, sure, do whatever you want." And within a, you know, I don't know, I was gonna say minute, not even a minute, a little less than a minute. This guy, the Harry Dean Stanton character, he just kind of touches the gear shift and then he moves his hand over onto his leg. At GTO's thigh. And, and GTO right away goes, I'm not into that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Harry Dean's like, I just thought it might relax you while you drive. Yeah, well, there you go. Sure. Little relaxation. I, I've done it many times myself. I get in a car, I'm thumbing a ride, I just put my hand on somebody's. <laughs> strange knee just to relax while they're driving because i like my drivers to be relaxed you gotta pay for that ride somehow it's kind of sad because uh if you berates him you know he's kind of hurt the guy he's the the yes. hitchhiker absolutely and he plays it really well i mean harry dean Stanton plays it well I, I i remember an interview with with monty hellman and he said you know you know harry didn't want to really do this he was kind of doing it begrudgingly because he really wanted the full part of GTO. He didn't oh, right, this right. Tiny little part. And he also didn't like the idea of playing a gay guy. He right. just felt uncomfortable with that. But Monty Hellman said something interesting. He said, I think it's one of Harry Dean Stanton's finest performances. He said, because he actually cries in the scene. Yeah. Further on down the road, they cross into Oklahoma and the GTO finally sees them on the side of the road. He, he pulls over and... They get out and they finally start talking. And you can see GTOs, again, still insecure about these these quote unquote car freaks. I, I love I love I love the olive branch. Tell them what the olive branch is, Jeff. <laughs> the mechanic offers them a hard boiled egg. Exactly. Now let me tell you something. I would not take a hard boiled egg from that guy <laughs> in a million years. It's not it's not even like he gives them the egg with a shell on it. It's already shelled. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't I would take this egg from this guy in a million years. They actually switch cars. GTO wants to check out the Chevy, so he rides in the Chevy. Not too comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> 
So the driver is in his Chevy and the GTO is riding along. It's nighttime. Right. And they have this conversation. GTO starts confessing to the driver and he's talking about how everything fell apart on me, my job, my family, everything. And he starts right. to go on about, it. I had this job as a TV producer. The driver interrupts him. He's like, I don't want to hear about it. Exactly. It's not my problem. It's not my problem. And, and that really is, that really is the way the driver is. Yeah. He's got this pure existence, right? That's this yeah. thing. Like he's the driver. This is what we do. And also he's young, right? At that age, you don't have yes. like the weight of life on you. Right. GTO's got some years on him. He's, he's had some weight over the years and the bumps and bruises that come with just living. And, and there's something about him, you know, he, something in his past, his marriage or whatever, something blew up, burnt yep. out, and he just yep. took off. That's, you know what I mean? That's those two characters right there. Yeah, right? I totally agree. Yeah. They make it to this town. It's basically dawn. There's nothing going but it's, on. Yeah, it's, it's very early on a Saturday. And, and, and they, the place is, the, 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 the gas station's closed up. Yeah. Even the men's room is locked. So the so GTO has to go find a place to, to relieve himself. Right. And he can't even use the bathroom, so he's got to lean up against the side of the building. What I really love about this scene is, is, is the rain. The rain works so well. It makes the scene work so well. And I read an interview with Monty Hellman where he was saying that, you know, we could have filmed on the day with the rain or we could have waited till the rain kind of, you know, stopped. And I just said to hell we'll just go and we'll, we'll try it and he said it actually made the scene work better because there's not a lot going on in the scene right 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 you know, it's just not much <laughs> going on in the scene but they had to run back and forth basically to get out of the rain whenever they could yeah, yeah. so like you know so so the, the mechanic goes across the street he's fiddling around with a, a license plate and gto goes well, what are you doing he goes well uh you know i, I don't really feel very comfortable in this part of the country, he said, uh, I, I, I don't like having out-of-state plates. So GTO right away gets himself <laughs> bent bent out of shape. Which, by the way, is a thing. Like, you're in the deep south or in the south. This is Oklahoma or maybe Tennessee by now. You have California plates. You got to be paranoid that the local cops are going to yeah. see your plate and pull you over. So well, let me smart. let me tell you something. I have been uh, the recipient of that sort of thing. Yeah. And when you are when you have New York plates or Jersey plates, and you're you're traveling outside of your area and you're going further down south, they are absolutely positively going to mess with you. The rain finally stops. The girl takes off. Uh, right. And the driver goes looking for her. Yeah. He, this is when he starts to get really paranoid about the girl leaving, and he seems to, to get really obsessed with her. But what's, what's strange is, you know, I, I don't know why he has this fixation on her because she doesn't really, you know, like him that much. She's, you know, she's, she's, she's bored with him. Hmm. Well, what's interesting about the scene is we talked about the old Route 66, et cetera. Right. As he's walking through the town, it's a really wonderful sequence where you, you kind of see this. T it's dead, this town. And I don't know if it's because right. it's the morning, but a lot of things look closed down. So he's walking through this town and a lot of things seem closed. You know, the thing about these old towns on Route 66, they got left behind when when the government built these interstate systems. Yes. And this town looks kind of dead. The, the movie theater looks closed as far as I yeah. can tell as he's walking yeah. past it. He actually goes to look into this in this cafe and that seems closed down. And then he drives out of town and he finds her, right? Thumb and a ride. Thumbing a ride. She's got all she's her on things. Her way out. She's on her way out. But without a word, he pulls up. She yep. just gets in. Yeah. It's almost like you mentioned uh, Godot earlier. Right. This is almost like that. It's they <laughs> can't get out of this existence, right? Yeah. She yeah. can't escape it. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. <laughs> All four of these characters are kind of trapped in this little world of theirs. So the driver takes her off to some other place where he's going to teach her how to drive the car. This is one way he can actually relate to the girl. He's talking about driving. He's teaching her about something that he knows how to do. It's kind of a tender scene because it's the only way he can really talk to this girl. And 
She tries it. The car conks out. He puts his hand on her hand on the gear shift. Right. It's it's like they're touching hands. Right. Well, doesn't she have her eyes closed? Because he's trying to get her to memorize the gear pattern. But see, what's interesting is like he can't. I've been in that situation. Maybe you have. You can't put into words what you want to say to this girl. Sure. Sure. Like, so she's like waiting. She's waiting. She's waiting. He can't do it. And as you said, is this a game? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because she's trying to do it. And he's he's giving her a little bit of an out and says, look, let me try it again. And he he does the gear shift pattern for her. And he goes, OK, try it again. And then she does it. And then she grinds the gears. That's it for him. Yeah. <laughs> you don't you don't grind the gears. No, <laughs> no. He goes, you know what? You're right. You can't. <laughs> And then he leans over to give her a kiss. And I like the way it's shot because it's not a romantic kiss type of thing. It's shot from behind uh, the driver's back. And you don't even see their faces meet. Right. Um, you just see she him lean in. So it's not like a real tender moment. It just kind of happens. It's kind of awkward. He doesn't quite know how to make the first move and stuff. And then she says something really revealing, which is interesting. The first time she seems like she's showing some sort of interest, she goes... I can do this when she starts kissing with him. So I right. thought that was pretty interesting because, you know, up until <clears throat> that point, she's ready to go back on the road again. She's had enough. Yeah. It's a wonderful shot when they're doing the gear shift and, and the camera's yeah. in the back seat and you just yeah. see this hand touching between yep. them. It's the only time yep. they ever really touch beside the yep. kiss. Uh, at this point, you know, uh, the, the the guy who uh, is either the, the, the gas station attendant or the owner, he's probably the attendant because he seems kind of young. He comes in and he looks around and he's going, what the hell's going on here? Well, GTO is fast asleep against the car. He's He's been so much in a panic about plates. <laughs> I need a plate. I don't want to be left out in a cold. And and he starts drinking heavily. And he's sitting there in the entranceway of the garage and there's a truck there. And he's been trying to get this plate off. <laughs> He can't even do that. Probably an hour. And and he 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 passes out mid, you know, mid crank on the yeah, bolt yeah. to get the plate out and he still hasn't been able to get it off there. So the guy calls the cops. You know, the, the gas station guy calls the cops. He's like, "What what the hell is this? These are out of state people and the souped up car and what I don't know what the hell's going on here." So the cops the cops come, which is pretty funny. And they take off in both cuz they actually have to drag GTO cuz he's so out. I actually think Beside the booze, he's coming down from whatever pills he's on. He's just finally, after all this driving on his own, he's just crashed. Yeah. So they literally have to drag him into the car. (laughs) And they both, they the driver and the mechanic each take a car and and head off and split up so that they can get away. The mechanic says to the girl, you know, what's going on? Because the the cops are coming on board. And she goes... The town woke up. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> which I thought was a good, a really good line. There's one scene I just have to mention because it's mentioned in Car and Driver magazine. I actually found a Car and Driver magazine article about this movie. The reason they did stop is the mechanic was looking at the engine of the GTO and he noticed the carburetor was something off on it. So they take off. The driver walks into an old-fashioned auto parts Auto parts, store. yeah. That's and a great he, scene. And they're going to rebuild the carburetor. He asks for parts to a GM Quadrajet, which is, mm-hmm. a, I, I guess, a four-barrel carburetor. There's your answer there, John. The car and driver, the line from the magazine, from the article, is, it's likely the only movie ever made that includes a scene where the main characters shop for a GM Quadrajet carburetor parts. <laughs> well, that's, that's a seal of approval if I ever heard one. I'm telling you. Really? They had they had their stuff down. Now you mentioned magazines. Here's another magazine that promoted the movie, and that's Esquire magazine. Oh, one of the hip one of the go. hip men's magazines of the day. Yeah. Lori Lori Bird was on the cover, Thumb and a Ride. And in that issue was the screenplay wow. for this movie. Interesting, right? It that's how hip this movie was gonna be. It's interesting at this point and I pointed out before about how fickle this girl is. Now she has moved over to the other side of the seat and she's massaging uh, the driver's shoulder. Right. And, and there's a really interesting thing that she says. She's massaging his shoulder and she goes, 
there's a little muscle jumping around in your neck. And he goes, I like it that way. <laughs> I, I, you know, he's a real romantic guy. <laughs> if a girl's willing to work out a knot in your shoulder that's jumping around, you may want to let her do that. You don't just say, I like it that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, there's a lot of geography in this movie. So now you yeah. see this road sign, they're crossing into Arkansas. Right. And there's a beautiful shot, long shot, with the Chevy coming across this bridge. Oh, it's a great shot. Over a river. And and then it cuts right away to another long shot of the GTO. Right. And he's driving, he's driving, he passes this roadside cafe and he sees the Chevy and he pulls and around screeches screeches, screeches to, a halt. to a halt comes back pulls in yeah and it's this typical southern roadside cafe bar cafe right yeah luncheonettes ser serving up Schlitz and Budweiser there and you go. uh um, so it's, it's great. Cause he comes in and he's all he's he's got his balls in an uproar he's all huffing and puffing and and sits down plops his ass down and the, and the waitress comes up to him and says what, you, what do you have? And he goes, uh, I have me a hamburger and a, an Alka-Seltzer. Because he sure as hell can use an Alka-Seltzer right now. That's what you did back in the day. Everything, everything with Alka-Seltzer for the, for the stomach. <laughs> All the adults, always with the Alka-Seltzer. Well, he's got a hangover. He's got, he's got you know, it's, it's the perfect thing. So this guy comes in, this redneck guy comes in. By the way, let me mention, the actor's name is Alan Vint. And I was gonna, I was gonna mention that, but you jumped to it. Go. Okay. Well, he came to fame a couple of years later with the movie Macon County Line, right? Which, which was like an early '70s kind of youth in the South kind of film. I, I saw it once. Movie. I don't remember it well. What do you remember about it? I, I don't remember it well either, but I remember, remember yeah, the movie. Yeah. I, I saw it. On, I saw it on television. I did not see it in the theater. Yeah, I saw it at the Melba Movie Theater. He was also in Badlands, John. <laughs> he played. A, he played one of the cops in Badlands. You're right. Good, good pickup there, Bob. So um, he comes up, this redneck guy comes up to them, and he's walking slow and kind of sizing them up. And right away, you're starting to feel tense. I know I was. And well, you could see you could yeah. see Warren Ellis was feeling tense, Exactly. Too. I thought, oh, is this the easy rider moment? You know, like... Well, I was thinking more of it. I was thinking more of the deliverance moment. There you go. I was Same just thing. Feeling, I, exactly. I was, I was feeling really uncomfortable as soon as this guy walked up. And he, he says, howdy. My buddies and I were uh, wondering where you all might be from. And I would have said, check, please. <laughs> right, right then and there. Yeah, that would have been it for me. So the driver replies, just passing through. And the guy gets perturbed by this and goes, uh, passing through? What do you mean by that? Once again, I'm thinking, oh, boy, they just stumbled into deliverance. Right. A year earlier than deliverance. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that Warren Oates, or GTO, he comes to the rescue. If GTO was not there to kind of sweet talk and bullshit his way through this whole conversation, especially when the guy says, "Yeah, y'all ain't hippies, are you?" <laughs> There's no way these guys would have survived. They would have beaten the living shit out of them. But Warren Oates makes up this whole big cockamamie story. I'm their agent, and they're racing this car. Well, and Mr. Warren Oates, bullshit artist, comes yes. up right on the spot. I'm their yes. manager, and they're exactly. looking at uh, they're looking at a, they're looking for a racetrack outside Memphis. So, I mean, without Warren Oates, <laughs> they would have gotten their ass kicked big time. There are these nice little scenes that just take place, and 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 little pieces of life pop up and whatnot. And there's a there's a there's a sequence where they have to avoid this accident that's right in the middle of the road. That's some asshole behind them. Some Dodge. Some, I'm sorry. It's a car, a Dodge Charger. They name right. it. Right. <laughs> and he's, and he's fucking with these guys. He's you know, tailgating the, the, them. Yeah. And, and, and suddenly he, he goes veering up around them and they don't see this accident because they're kind of looking at the rear view mirror and stuff. And then they almost crash into this accident that spilled all over the highway. And the driver goes to take a look at what's going on. And it's this guy just sitting there looking at this guy who's uh, half in, half out of the car, and he's dead. I mean, it, it looks well, like it's a like, real yeah. fucking accident. It's, an old, it's like an old farmer. His truck is overturned. Right. And the station wagon that crashed into him, the, the driver's half out the driver's side 
door and his neck is broken, says the farmer. And the farmer's kind of in shock. I love the actor. And that's, that's, uh, that's George Mitchell. And uh, he was in Ride the Whirlwind, as we talked about. In oh, that right. Show. Okay. And he's the guy hacking away at that stump. Doggedly determined to, oh, is to, that get, the guy? Yeah, to, yeah. to get that stump. Got it. So he, he's trying to tell he's trying to tell the driver about what happened. And, and how the damn fool just kept on coming at me on the wrong side of the road. The damn fool. I, I couldn't do and James Taylor just just walks away. Yeah. This guy's this guy's looking for absolution. He's looking for something. He's looking for it's okay, it's not your fault, some sort of reassurance. And James Taylor just turns mid-sentence and walks away. Once again, cold. Not concerned with everyday matters. No. You just know what I mean? what's going on for him. He's, yeah. It's almost he's like a samurai actually. <laughs> no, seriously. Okay. He's he's a samurai. He, okay. It's only about it's only about your craft. Yeah, everything goes by the wayside. You have to focus on your craft and your task. I never thought of it as a samurai, but John, I I, I, I tip my hat off to you. <laughs> that's a good that's a good analogy. But it's heartbreaking because I feel so of bad course. for this guy. He just wants somebody to talk to and say it's okay. It's gonna be okay. It's not your fault. And this guy just turns and walks away. Horrible. Uh, so they end, by, they end up at this racetrack in Memphis. The girl is totally bored. She just goes into the stands. These races are going on. People are in the stands. This is like a big event. This is like, as you said, Raceway Park, in a sense. Right. And and, and they're do, doing, I guess, qualifying heats or something. They, there were these racetracks all over the country. And you, on a weekend, everyone brought their hot rods. And you just kind of, there were different classes based on your car. Nitro burning funny cars. There were funny cars, there were dragsters, there were street hot rods, but you raced within your class. So she finally leaves. And the, the sad thing is, you know, she's the, the driver gets in, he just qualified and, and, and he got to set up a race. And he's trying to, you know, still work it so the girl is interested and he's talking about, you know, we'll go, uh, after we get to D.C., uh, you know, we can go down to Florida. You know, they got some, they got some really nice beaches down there and... He's just trying to talk it up. And while he's talking up, trying to make this enticing, she's packing her bag, literally. Packing yeah. Her bag. She's <laughs> putting all her shit in it. She's clipping it close. He's eyeballing her. You know, he knows he's kind of finding a losing game, but he's uh, he sees this kind of happening. And he gets out. And then she just picks her stuff up, leaves, and plops her ass into the next car, <laughs> into right. GTO's car. Yeah. And they're driving along for a while. She's kind of falling asleep. He's, he's kind of kind of pouring his heart out to her. He says, darling, we got time for a quick bite, and we'll go on. Doesn't matter where, as long as we got time to grab a little peace now and then. And I thought, wow, that's a really nice line. But then he fucks it up. He just goes, well, what I really mean to say is I'm crazy about you. And I thought, wow, that's really, that's the only time he actually says a real line in the whole movie. He actually reveals himself. He he got he kind of ends it with he goes as he said we'll build a house because if I'm not grounded pretty soon, I'm going to go into orbit. Right. He does it beautifully. It it yeah. seems like it's the language coming out of his head. You know. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was terrific. It's a terrific no, it's, scene. It's very touching. Yeah. It's daytime. They pull into this Esso station, and right outside, frame right in the middle of frame. Yeah. Is this chopper right? This motorcycle. Talk about some foreshadowing, right? Yeah. It's a perfectly, perfectly set up shot. You know from that shot exactly <laughs> what's going to happen. It's a gas station diner. And again, it's almost like a Weston. They walk in the door and at the counter is this young, very handsome young man. He's young. Sitting there eating breakfast. You need a, you need a little dun, 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 dun. <laughs> 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 a little good to bed the ugly. A little, little, little Ennio Manicone. So they sit down to have breakfast. And she and the boy have kind of given each other the eye. So finally, the driver is now in his car with the mechanic. He's driving full out because he wants to find this girl. And the mechanic is actually nervous. And, and rightly so. He says, you're going to get us killed, man. Yeah. So they're fine. They're looking all over, and they finally, finally find them in this Esso station. Right. 
So they come in, they sit down at the, the table where GTO and the girl are. And GTO's thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, God damn it. <laughs> the driver sits down and he just stares at the girl. Right. And he finally lays his cards on the line, right? Right. He's like, I figure we can go on up to Columbus, Ohio. Some guy selling some parts real cheap. Yeah, he's he's a real romantic at heart. Yeah, I'm telling you, man. A regular Cyrano de Bergerac. <laughs> <laughs> She's done. She's like, no good. GTO realizes this. He just gets up and walks away from the table. She gets up. She goes outside. Yes. And we see this play out in the window. It's taken. It's all taking place outside the window. And here, here's your separation again, John. Right? Here's here's a another person out there. Right. And then you got the the room separation, the glass separation, and they're in two different worlds. So she just takes her stuff out of GTO's car, and she just makes her way. No dialogue, nothing. She makes her way down to the motorcycle. Who's waiting for her? Right. She's about to get on, but they can't fit. So she has to leave all her belongings behind. And that's it. She just leaves everything. She just leaves the duffel bag on the ground of the parking lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. And And it's a great shot when they finally just go outside. You see GTO finally get in his car and pull away. The way the shot is set up, there's the car on the left-hand side, the the 55 Chevy, and GTO pulls away because I'll see you. And there's the duffel bag laying there with, with all her belongings, and that's the end of that. Yeah. And it's the end of the race, kind of, because... They come outside, right? And then they find these these other guys there, and they start negotiating their next race. What's interesting, I thought the girl finally, finally, yeah. finds her place. Like this young guy, her age, her world. They're both going to go off into the sunset. These other characters are left to their existence. You know what I mean? They're still trapped in their world of the road. But, but her, her whole world is uncertain, too, because she goes from one thing to the next to the next, and there are no guarantees. You right, know, it's, but I, you're, you're I felt just, at least the guy is young, he's her contemporary. Kind of closer in line yeah. to where she's at. Yeah. yeah. My heart was hoping for the best for her. Maybe they go off and have a life. The denouement. <laughs> <laughs> the story after the story. So next, GTO, once again, picks up more hitchhikers, right? <laughs> And he gets these two. Let the stories begin. Now we finally see some uh, soldiers, probably from Vietnam. They're out on, they're off on leave. These two soldiers get into his car, and he tells them, oh, "Where they go, John? Where are they going? New York City." <laughs> That's right. And just <laughs> it just so happens, what he could take them all the way. He could take them all the. Of course, he can. <laughs> what's interesting though is he starts going on on this i'm not going to do the dialogue and this yeah. little story about he won this car he's driving in a race he his car was something he built from scratch there's nothing like building up a car from scratch yeah. and i wiped out one of those detroit machines and this is the car <laughs> he's driving and he won it He's kind of reversed the story. Of course he has. It's bizarre. He got he got new material. He, he <laughs> kind of chewed it up for a while and spit it back out. It's there brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, that's a wonderful, I would say, screenplay moment there. The way Absolutely. you just come full circle. And then we get down to the, the next race. The nitty gritty for these guys. What they're all about. Right. It's an El Camino. You are correct. It is an El Camino. It is an El and Camino. And it's funny because there's something about El Caminos I never liked. It just looked kind of looked like a pickup truck. I always felt it was an ugly car. Personally, I did. I can't see one as a, a drag racer, but in any case. So they're at the starting line. So the driver's sitting there, and he looks out the window. Right. And across the way, he sees these horses in a field. Right. And then he closes the window. And what's really cool about this scene is the sound. Because... He closes it fast. The plexiglass window slides it shut, and it makes this boom sound, almost like a tomb closing or something. And all the sound drops out of it, which really isolates the moment. Then they take off, and now you're in the driver's car. And they're moving down the drag strip, and all of a sudden, you see the film get caught in the projector, and it starts to burn. Right. 
And for me, that's what happens. He's driving down the strip, he gets into an accident, and he crashes and burns. It's interesting. There's many interpretations. I thought that too. Like, is this, does this mean death? But the sound that drops out just gives you this feeling. There's a forebodingness to Oh, yeah. It. As I mentioned earlier, he looks off at those horses. There's something ethereal about it. It's like a Zen moment. He sees these horses. Is that like some kind of heaven? You know, the way I can look at it is there's the life outside. Yeah. There's nothing left to chance for right. Monty Hellman. I, I agree with you. It could symbolize death. Like there's... Right. I always thought, well, it could also be... You know, it's just this endless loop. Like, hes they're always going to be on this road. It's like purgatory. They're never going to get away. Here's an interesting thing. I saw an interview with Monty Hellman, and he was saying that while he was editing the film, he had this dream, this, I guess, nightmare. Because, mm-hmm. you know, anybody, as you, you and I have done in our day, who's ever run film through a projector. Right. Oh, yeah knows the horror of seeing that film just burn before your eyes because it got caught, broken sprocket holes or whatever, and it just, it just, that bulb is so hot, it burns the film right away. So Monty Hellman had this dream or nightmare and that that the footage was going and all of a sudden it burned. Hmm. And he said, he just had this image in his head, had this image in his head. He doesn't feel that it means anything but that the film, he's the filmmaker, he's making this picture, and right. and that's the end of his part of telling the story or documenting the story, but the life still goes on. What I, what I say to that is this. I want my ending. He gets into a car crash, and he, he crashes and burns, and that's the end of it. Because it just it just feels so ominous to me. Yeah. So that's my interpretation. Of what it also made about. me think of is a couple of years later— We've done this film. Scorsese did Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. And that film ends very similarly. The film doesn't burn. It kind of jumps out of the sprockets. It's interesting. I always, It made me think yes. of those two things. It was funny. Both of those characters, you know, Scorsese and Monty Hellman, they're, they're so, you know, motion picture yeah. on yeah. the brain kind right. of thing. How right. does it look visually and, and how does film move through that, that camera or the moviola when you're editing it? Right. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I was reading about Lou Wasserman, the head of Universal. He hated the movie, so he wouldn't distribute it. It just seems like you're just shooting yourself, not in the foot, but in the head. Yeah. You know? like, uh, you, already, you already spent the money on it. Uh, what are you thinking? Uh, I, I, wanna, I have a coda. So we're talking, we were talking about the cars. Yeah. I read this. The GTO made it into Universal's motor pool and for several years would show up in TV, TV series like Adam-12, Kojak, and Beretta. You're kidding. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, the funny thing is that uh, that, that uh, Ward Oates did a lot of television, so maybe he, he made his way through this. <laughs> Back to that car somehow. The 55 Chevy, Yeah. they painted it black and George Lucas used it in... No American way. Graffiti, Harrison Ford's car in American Graffiti. That's that's pretty that, cool. That's, that's totally cool, and that's proof positive that um, that George Lucas, uh, being the uh, the racing buff that he was, almost dying in a car crash in a street race, um, would would use that exact car. Yeah. To make that movie, that's pretty neat. <laughs> uh, some 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 good some good facts there, John. I like that. I like the fact that they're. It's like the studios, uh, we got to use these cars. We got them. Those greedy bastards. Nothing it goes to art. waste. <laughs> they made a piece of art, you idiots. I know. Those two cars should be in a museum. You know, one of the things that I get out of the film is it's very 70s, obviously. But there's a thing to the 70s, the, the me generation, I got to do my own thing. I got to be free and I want freedom. But... I think the problem here is that these characters have too much "quote unquote" freedom. Huh. They have nothing tethering them to right. the ground. They have nothing to connect themselves to other human beings, to society, etc. And because of this, they, they they're lost. It's almost like you're watching the Night of the Living Dead. You know, they're yeah. just kind oh, of kind yeah. of shells of people. And um, <clears throat> you know, GTO's point about if I don't get grounded soon. I'm just going to float off into outer space and 
And I think that's unfortunately what these characters are doing because they're not tethered to anything. Yeah. Too much freedom may not be such a good idea. And also at the time, I think that's really a perfect analysis of it. At the time, road movies had made a comeback. You had Easy Rider, obviously, which put everything, everyone wanted to do a road movie. Sure. Uh, and then you, had, you got Badlands, Vanishing Point. Right. right. Same year, Vanishing Point. So the studio was really big on this film. They wanted this to be a big hit. Lou Wasserman didn't. I guess <laughs> that's not the film. He, he was looking for an easy rider, obviously. But Hellman turned this into this poetic, philosophical oh, yeah. film about the road. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the best road movies ever made. And, and, I, and I, I think it's, it's far superior to Easy Rider. I mean, Easy Rider has its own thing going for it, but this is a far superior film to Easy Rider. Well, I it's, think. it's it's pure cinema as opposed to Easy Rider, which is more of a story. Yeah, the film I would compare it to is is one of your and my favorites. Yeah, uh, it's a road movie. Yeah, it's uh, takes place in Germany. Kings of the Road. Yeah, it's more it's closer to Kings of the Road. I sure. Think. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Which this film was definitely a big influence on, I believe. Uh, a, a great film by Wim Wenders, yeah, also yeah. known as Wim Wenders. <laughs> but since I'm not German, I don't say Wim. But my feeling is, you know, with Monty Hellman at the helm, uh, this, is a, this is a classic 70s movie. Uh, no clear answers and no happy endings. Amen to that. Well, that's all the time we have this week. We'd like to thank our friend Glenn Ornowitz for his music. And of course our listeners for tuning in. So join us next week for another episode of Film Detour. If you like our show, please recommend us to your friends. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetour.libsyn.com to leave comments or email us with questions. That's filmdetour.lib. SYN.com. You can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can also find us on YouTube.